Our oceans are absorbing the vast majority of the heat associated with global warming. In fact, oceans absorb 90% of global warming heat. And that is a lot of energy. Well, it's really enormous. And it's so big that we have to use really obscure terms like zeta joules. Uh, and a zeta is a number with 21 zeros after it. That was John Abraham. He's a professor of thermal science, and he was involved in some research that showed that last year was a record year for the amount of heat absorbed by our oceans. Last year, they absorbed 14 zettajoules of energy. Now, we humans have trouble wrapping our head around a number that big, so I'll give you two analogies. One is toasters. I want you to imagine a toaster that uses about a thousand watts of power it would be 440 billion toasters running nonstop day and night. That's a wow. lot of toasters. It's like a kind of nuclear explosion going off in the ocean on a regular oh. basis. Oh, oh, I'm glad you asked that because the other analogy is uh, nuclear explosions. And if you compare the amount of heat going into the oceans to let's say the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, it's seven Hiroshima bombs every second, day and night, around the clock. That's how much heat is going into our ocean. This huge amount of heating obviously has implications. It has implications for the animals that live below the waves. A lot of sea animals have a temperature range of one or two degrees in which they can survive or thrive. As the temperatures rise, these animals are dying, including these beauties, corals. A classic example is corals. The, there's been a dramatic increase in coral bleaching events, which uh, are degrading our coral reefs. Uh, and those stories have been prevalent in the last decade or so. So corals are a great example where the heat particularly or the heat directly impacts them. And there's another impact that I've heard a lot about, but I've never truly understood, the acidification of our oceans. When we spew all that excess carbon dioxide into the sky, well, it's the oceans that absorb most of the carbon dioxide, and that has some really vivid implications. Think about a soda. A soda is actually a carbonated beverage, and we make sodas by uh, introducing carbon dioxide into water. Well, we're doing the same thing in the oceans, we're turning our oceans into soda pop. And that changes the chemistry of the ocean and it makes it harder for animals that create shells to form and keep their shells. All of this matters because all of biodiversity matters. It's the life support system that sustains life on Earth. But in the medium term, there are other consequences we are already experiencing. And that's bouts of extreme weather. So as we heat up the oceans, more water evaporates, more energy goes into the atmosphere and storms become more severe. So in, in terms of specifics, we are seeing a number of areas of the world where the cyclones or hurricanes are becoming stronger because of climate change. Now, I'm not saying that there are more of them, but they are becoming stronger. But there's more than that. Oceans drive uh, precipitation events and drought inland. So what we're finding is Areas that are currently wet are becoming wetter and we're getting heavier rainfalls with more flooding. Areas that are currently dry are generally becoming drier. And uh, another rule of thumb is when rain happens, it happens in bigger events. I would say this, nowhere can you go on the planet Earth where the weather is not impacted by warming oceans. Now, John says there is really only one way to tackle this massive problem, and that is to collectively get together and reduce carbon emissions. The Earth has a fever, we know that, and unless we start the medication, that fever will get worse and worse and worse. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please leave us your feedback, your comments. Maybe just share how much you love corals. We'd love to hear from you. You're part of this project. My name's Chris Cummins. This was FMFIA's Klima News.